Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. It's the second and final day of our playthrough of Alice is Missing. A completely silent role-playing game for up to five players that is played entirely over text messenger, discord, or some other equivalent. My students have been playing four games of Alice is Missing simultaneously in our classroom since Tuesday. As I mentioned in a brief video on Tuesday, most of that day, 55 minutes of our 75 minute class were spent in the preparations, uh, pulling up characters, establishing initial hunches, going through safety tools and doing those kinds of spoken infrastructure tasks. It's a little more than it took when I ran the game over Discord and Roll20, and that's to be expected. I played with three players. Um, our tables are running from three to five players, and the logistics of especially recording the final voicemail messages is a little trickier inside the classroom. Not super challenging, but here we are. Today ran really uh, on rails. Um, one of the interesting uh, things is the timer function uh, that runs for the silent part of the actual role-playing game means that I knew exactly where we'd ended last time and could start immediately there. I actually started the timer five minutes earlier um, as I was kind of getting set up and resetting all of the tables for class, which led to some straggler students who are still arriving before class started being really confused because, right, the, the tables were all set up and people were on their phones because people are on their phones. Uh, so I actually had to say, we're not started yet. We'll start when the timer hits 70 and then we'll really get started. I will say one of my concerns about running this game over multiple days was would resetting the tables be easy? And it was. Um, I have one physical copy of the game and then the rest are print and plays, uh, which is a, another legal version of the game that you can get from um, from the, uh, the developers at Renegade Studios. And so we paper clipped the each character sheet, the clue cards they had drawn, still face down, um, their character card and their motive card all together. Um, and so there was a stack of character stuff. Um, any face up cards we clipped together. And then we just kind of restacked everything else and kind of rubber banded it or, or clipped it together. Um, for the print and plays, they fit neatly into a standard size envelope, which I then labeled with the color of the table because our tables are color coded. Um, for the one physical copy of the game, it's actually a little trickier. I needed bigger binder clips than the ones that I had because these are really beautiful, large cards that are quite thick and sturdy. Um, so when I run this game again, and I will run this game again, um, I will invest in a bunch more standard size as opposed to mini size binder clips to keep the game organized between classes. Um, other word about storage, uh, I do have or did have a bunch of print and play copies of the game. And as soon as the game was over today, I had students keep their character records because we're going to be talking more about this next Tuesday. But um, Everything else of those print and plays went right into the recycle because I realized that I will teach this again and I want to teach this with um, physical copies of the game. It's a really beautiful game. It's at this moment 20 bucks, 21 bucks uh, to buy. It doesn't, as you can see, take up a lot of space, uh, which is my definition of a game that I can buy for the class uh, in multiples. This is also... Um, you can see actually right behind me copies of For the Queen um, doing that same kind of work. And in fact, as I was talking to students in class today, one of the things that was a light bulb moment uh, for the next iteration of this course is that we will fold this in much earlier in another version of this class. This, uh, the text-based uh, role-playing 
um, was something that my students took to like a duck to water, even the ones who were totally new with role playing games. It's another largely GM less system, although it does have a facilitator at the table, the Charlie, um, which I could kind of somewhat embody and then also share that responsibility with all of the other tables. And so it fits actually quite nicely after a game like For the Queen and maybe The Quiet Year as the kind of second or third game uh, to introduce how role-playing games work. And then we can get into games that have more elaborate structures around character creation and more kind of mechanics around chance that aren't card-based but are then dice-based. Um, and so more on that as after I get the full feedback from my students, but that's where I'm thinking right now, especially since, as I've mentioned in the previous video for this week, we are reaching a critical mass of games that are set in high school and college, the age of my students, um, or actual plays that are set in high school or universities that are connected to other role-playing systems. So I mention uh, them more fully in a kind of scroll on Tuesday, but just to give you an example, um, you've got Cinder Hearts um, for another twist on the high school structure. You've got Kids on Bikes and Kids on Brooms for um, thinking more in a kind of kid space and with a different mechanic. In terms of actual plays, uh, Kids on Brooms is the basis for Dimension 20's Misfits and Magic. Um, and Fantasy High and all of these kind of related uh, seasons of things like The Seven um, are all connected to D&D. Um, and so uh, you've got some interesting kind of cross-pollination transformation of systems. In terms of D&D itself, Strixhaven, it will be out by the time that I teach this class again, uh, hopefully next fall. Uh, and you've got things like L.A. by Night, w which are not officially collegiate minded, but start out from the space of a university with a focal character of a college student. In the case of, say, L.A. by Night, it's the vampire system and it's using Erika Ishii's transformation from college student to whatever comes next uh, after you become a vampire in the realms of the undying. Um, whether that will continue to be true, whether those kind of educational connections will continue to be true in New York by night, which is the kind of next iteration of what Jason Carl is doing um, for actual play in the worlds of darkness, I'm going to be very curious about um, because it will determine whether that's a story I can continue to tell. I do know Jason Carl also tackles that as part of the setting for Seattle by night, so it makes me somewhat optimistic, um, but we'll see. There's lots and lots, lots more. I could talk about Adventure Zone graduation. Um, I'm hoping that if you're watching this, you might have some ideas as well. And of course, I'm always looking for more suggestions. And there's a lot to think about, about the ways in which this becomes a fertile ground, in part because a lot of game developers are, are that age or have connections to the educational spaces of high school and college. Um, in fact, one of my friends from college just told me that her best man was one of the developers of Kids on Bikes. So I don't even know. Like, the world is small. Um, so there's, I think, an iteration of this course that can take some focalizing through the lens of saying role-playing games are often about imagining a world just parallel to ours as a kind of what-if. Um, and, and then and then we can build out from there as the students kind of want to explore other other worlds and other concepts. But uh, this is this is what I'm thinking at the moment. Stay tuned. Um, I, I will continue to be interested in the ways that history is reflected in games um, for other courses. Uh, but definitely Alice is missing has shown me, has made me think even more intentionally about the possibility of a, of a class that, that starts from a kind of pool of educationally minded or educationally set games. I will say I called this the Alice is Missing week and that we 
going we're going to try to play this game just in the span of these two class sessions and I do want to say for the people who are watching this um, to think about whether they want to integrate it into their own uh, classes is not really um, to do this game responsibly you need a fair amount of aftercare some of that aftercare we were we were able to do uh, in the space of class even though we only had about a handful of minutes after we played the voicemails and finished the actual events of the game. Um, I was able to kind of do the check-in on how everybody was feeling, that everybody was okay. Um, I had students turn over their character records and write down um, initial thoughts about what they wanted to uh, keep of their character and take with them as well as what they wanted to leave behind which I think was in, was very important to ensure that um, we kind of were in the right mindset to leave the classroom and everyone was in good shape I mean I think part of this is you're playing it in daylight I'm going to be interested on Tuesday to see how much of a kind of engagement versus kind of somewhat free-floating removal comes from playing this in a classroom space but so stay tuned on that one um but figuring out the full resolution of these narratives is something that was going to take more time. And so I made a note to students that we would have that further discussion on Tuesday, that I would make more space not all, for each table to kind of spend some time um, resolving the plots. Because one of the other reasons why I think Alice is Missing is really handy, and you might want to teach it if you teach stuff like um, like I'm an 18th centuryist and I teach the epistolary novel, which is a form that uh, students aren't especially familiar with, right? We don't write that many novels and letters these days, but we do consume a lot of art that thinks about the kind of mechanics of other means of communication that we do use. And Alice is Missing as a text message role-playing game means that its characters are always separated by design. They must always be separated throughout the entire game. Um, and so there's a whole lot that from their individual perspectives, they don't know. And so you have to have that moment after gameplay to resolve what's actually happened. And so this is going to happen on Tuesday, as well as more of a full response from my students. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, next week starts the... Um, full um, playtime for the students. The final we are in the final three weeks of class, and they're working on their unessays and they are doing all kinds of things. Everything from creating educational resources to podcasts to adventures of their own to world building of their own to world building for some of our guests. Um, and so most of that's going to be free time once we finish our discussion of Alice is missing. And we do a little bit of exposure to our printmaking setup for those who might want to play with it. And that's mostly because that's my baby and we we work in that building. It's something students were curious about and interested in. Uh, and we're going to make a little bit of a keepsake on Tuesday uh, as we transition into their individual projects. We'll do one more thing where we make something together. We may also have one more guest, uh, although we are still figuring out how the timing logistics are going to work. Um, the guest was hoping to come on Tuesday, which is the last day that has stuff booked. So we'll see. This may all get kind of tossed in a little bit of a blanket. But um, what I said to the guest was, it's very, very important that my students have this kind of moment of, of reflection and safety and kind of resolution for the game that they've just been playing. So I hope that we're able to figure out another time to talk because I know we're really excited. If you've been following this uh, for long enough, you know who this is, but I kind of almost don't want to jinx it. So more, more soon. Um, I've gotten permission from my students uh, to spend one of our uh, lab days actually away from them, uh, were available by email. So over the next two weeks, um, they'll be, it, we're basically talking parallel play at this point. Um, next week, I'm encouraging students to 
um, in consultation with me, make a plan for their works, uh, their work in class, and to find buddies to do um, critique, uh, feedback, even play testing um, in consultation with one another. So we're going to see how the next fortnight goes because it's all in their hands leading up to the very final week, week 15, where we'll have a show and tell of what students have done for their unessays. Every student is required to produce one unessay across the semester. If students who wish to achieve, to achieve an A in the class contract to do two. So I've already seen some unessays and they are amazing. Everything from uh, twine games to timelines, uh, to lesson plans for um, how to teach games in a high school context. So I'm excited to see what's next um, and I will share as much of it as I am able to with all of you. So it's Thursday, which is a wonderful day in this class and I hope you have a good weekend. See you soon.